What's up, y'all? Listen up. So this week, we are putting out two episodes. That's right. Two episodes. Tuesday at 5 and Friday at 5. Stay tuned for both of them. Ryan Leslie is our first guest on Tuesday, and he is a legend in the music game and a legend in the tech industry. And on Friday, we are putting out Nick Storm, a legend in the spirits industry. That's right. So rocks on. So check us out Tuesday and Friday. Stay tuned. Philly. It's your turn. That's right. March 14th, March 15th. We're coming to the city for a two-day weekend takeover. Yeah, we're doing a live podcast and a workshop on Sunday. Yes, March 14th, the live podcast, open bar, catered, private networking event. Our brother, Wallo267, our brother, Big Business, Fred and the legend himself, Nehemiah Davis, will all be guests on the podcast. What You know how we do a bunch of other EYL alumni are going to be in the building. Yeah. As I said, open bar, catered. Private networking event afterwards, a whole entire vibe. You know how we do. Drink responsibly, act accordingly. And we're going to have some special guests there, too. We're not going to tell you about that just yet. So make sure y'all get tickets. Yes. And then Sunday, we have our workshop with Alex Good Energy, the mm-hmm. legend himself, trucking guru. Kashif Edwards' his episode is going crazy right now. Straight out of Philly, vending machine. Uh, vending machine. Yep. Yes. And then Atia Blair and Aisha Sheldon are going to do a tag team real estate workshop on how to build a million dollar real estate portfolio starting with zero dollars so it's going to be crazy everything from vending machine trucking real estate and we never know we can ask somebody else along as well so two-day event um all of the information is on eylexperience.com um so don't wait get your tickets philly we will see you soon All right, guys, welcome back. Earn Your Leisure Podcast. Yeah, I got it. So, all right, we're going to jump right into it. Um, you know, we try to take requests from our listeners as much as we possibly can. We try to facilitate it. So, yeah. you know, we get a lot of different requests for different people, and we try to try to make it happen. And um, one, of the, one of the top requests that we've been getting, especially recently, yeah. is um, a legend in the music game and also in the tech game as well, yeah. um, Ryan Leslie. Yeah. And um, so people hit us up. And they're like, yo, you should get them on the podcast. And actually, it's ironic because um, behind the scenes, I was working for like months to try to make it happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I remember, like but, to September, we got the, yo, he might come on. I'm like, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, let's do it. Yeah, but, but we're here now. But you know, we, we did it. So um, yes, Ryan Leslie needs no introduction, but I'll give him one. Um, as I said, uh, um, a legend in the game, um, producer, singer, rapper, um, worked with some of the biggest names in history, yeah. Kanye West, um, Diddy. Beyonce, Beyonce, Cassie, produce, like, um, Fabulous, Lloyd Banks. The list goes on. The list <laughs> crazy, goes on. Crazy, crazy. But now he's doing his thing um, in tech. Obviously, he's a smart guy. If you know his backstory, he went to Harvard. Um, so, fifteen. Yeah. <laughs> like, he also got a perfect score on the SAT. I saw. Yeah, we can't just breeze so, over these things. <laughs> so yeah. So without further ado, Ryan Leslie. Um, first and foremost, um, thank you for joining us. Yeah, Appreciate thanks it. Thanks for coming, man. Yeah. So I've, I hear y'all going to Philly. I didn't get the invite. You know what I'm saying? Oh, we're going oh, to yeah, right, well, we're we're invited right, right now. You know, you know what happens? Like usually yeah. toward the end, they like, yo, I'm yeah. coming to Philly. Yeah. Yeah. You, know, you just kind of gave it oh, away. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, bet, bet, bet. Yeah. So, so we'll talk a little bit about the workshop. So, time. so the workshop is, um, so you know, like a lot of people do like financial seminars. Yeah. But our thing is different, um, because. We bring different people on. So it's really like kind of like a concert. That's how I really like to frame it yeah. because it's like each city that we – we built so many strong relationships with the podcast that each city that we go to, we have like people in the city, and we try to switch it up. So like we yeah. might do trucking one city. We might do real estate. We might do wholesaling. We might do stocks. You never know. So presenters come on, and they present for about 45 minutes. It's interactive. People ask them questions. And um, yeah, it's about two and a half hours, three hours. Yeah. Afterwards, they stay, ask questions. So – it's and it's it's an intimate setting, mm-hmm. yeah. so um yes, yeah, it's, yeah, it's something that we, we, we really try like. to compare. Like when we talk about music, we try to compare like what Khaled does when he goes on tour. Yeah, exactly. right. Every time we go to a city, you never we bring know somebody from that up. city. Yeah. So every right. time we go to a city, whether we in Houston, we gonna bring somebody from Houston to come speak. And when we go to Atlanta, we bring the people from Atlanta. And now we in Philly, mm-hmm. we bring the Philly uh, people out. So okay, so maybe I need to do the New York then. Oh, oh New York, oh, yeah, we, New York's gonna be crazy. Okay. New York is gonna be. We will talk off air about that. We gonna tell you about that. New York gonna be. We gonna tell you about that. So yeah. So, all right, so we're going to talk about a few different things, but um, I would like to start with the music because 
that's where you originally started as far as um, you know your career. So we talked about music a lot, um, but we never covered it from a producer standpoint. Yeah. I just realized that today when I was prepping for this. Yeah, we had Derek talk about from the executive standpoint. Executive, we, we had Mickey Fats talk about from Mickey the artist. Shout out to him. He did a dope freestyle. But for we us never too. really had somebody break it down from the person who's actually making and curating that music. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So as far as you getting in the game, um, how did how did your career path take as as a producer first, and even figuring out as far as like points on an album and negotiating royalties and things of that nature. Yeah, I mean, I think now more than ever it's, it's important to know your math <laughs> on that. I think really when I when I was getting started the the goal and I think actually in a lot of ways when people start getting into music, they just say, "Look, I just want to have the biggest hits possible and, you know, it's inevitable if I have a really big hit that I'm 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 going to get paid." Mm-hmm. You know? And uh there's a lot of there are a great number of revenue streams and there are a great number of revenue streams that are potentially overlooked and so you know for me coming up in the game i was very fortunate to have really great mentors and uh folks that were working with me had signed me management all of that and so they really helped me to sit down and and understand not only just my paperwork and my contracts Mm -hmm. but what all the actual revenue streams are so with music i mean First of all, I, I, I would say, look, information is so readily available online. It's just about knowing what to search mm-hmm. and then also knowing what's reliable. And so, listen, you know, for me, even still today, there's your performance rights organizations, which is like your ASCAP, your BMI. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you have your actual uh, publishing. So whoever's actually administering your publishing. So I know there's a ton of folks that are putting music up on Spotify and, you know, distributing their music through an aggregator like a CD Baby, Distro Kid, cool whatever corn. it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, they completely overlook the actual uh, other side of the publishing and so you still need an administrator on that publishing side and that's and so um, you know I just had a great meeting with downtown music holdings and they've got probably one of the, the leading from a technology standpoint um, uh, platforms for that publishing administration is called song trust and so you know I think uh, nowadays everything is basically self-service and software mm-hmm. really has been that equalizer i would say and for me i just like to be in control of my revenue stream so i like to be able to look at uh be able to just log in to my accounts and see them all uh even if that means that you know they may be delayed uh, i just want to be uh 100 on top of them so i mean I, i'm not sure if i'm even a- answering your question per se when i first got started i would just say like, look i was very much concerned with an advance and i think a lot of folks when they first get started You've been living in the basement. You've been, you know, yeah. living out the trap wherever you live in. You want that advance because that advance is that first way that you're going to pay for all those years of starvation, if you will. So the, the advance is the money that the record label is giving to you saying, like, here's the money that you get to do the, the project. Yeah. And I mean, it's actually an advance against your royalties. Okay. Right. So um, on the artist side, depends on the type of deal you make. Uh, and, and I mean, listen. Business is really just business, uh, and whatever you sign is whatever you sign. I, I know there's definitely always been a lot of talk about like, hey, you know, people are, you know, they got they got into slave deals, and you know, you hear these kinds of, <laughs> Wait, you hear these kinds of like, yeah, <laughs> overtones yeah, all yeah, the time. Yeah, yeah. At the end of the day, I think you know, as long as you've got good legal counsel and you're sitting down and you're looking at your contracts, you're definitely the final arbiter of what deal you get into and so it's important for you just to just know and be informed so for me my bible level primer for the music industry and this is an age-old primer is a donald passman book all you need to know about the music business it's updated all the time and i you know i always recommend look somebody that really wants to know they can start there and it's updated and it was written by an attorney uh who definitely just understands just the nuances of the business and then uh you know, no matter what's actually written in the books, it's different when you're actually sitting across a negotiation table yeah. and you're going to negotiate whatever deal is best for you at that time. And so, you know, I find that there are a lot of folks that when they're sitting at their at that negotiation table and they've never seen 5,000, 10,000, 20,000, 100,000 at one time in their bank account, much less 500,000 or a million dollars. 
in those situations, they say, oh, yeah, definitely sign me up for that without actually looking at what the actual what the contractual obligations are that are associated with signing those deals. At the end of the day, though, you know, life just goes on. And uh, I, I was just having a conversation today. Life is really like water. It's it, it's fluid. And basically, uh, the time that you have takes on the shape of whatever container that you uh, that, that you put around your life. And so if you put a container around your life where you get that upfront advance and it's a big upfront advance and you're able to do in a smart way what you should do with that and you're keeping track of your accounting and when that advance is recouped, et cetera, then that may be the right pathway for you as opposed to delaying the gratification and waiting 18 months to actually let the publishing or the royalties trickle in. So let me ask you this, because a lot of times, especially with producers, there's been a lot of record labels, won't name any record labels, but there's a lot of record labels where producers say that they don't get paid, right? It's like a, it happens all the time. Mm -hmm. So why is it such an epidemic with producers specifically producers making beats and getting delayed on their payments or not getting paid um, because you hear about that all the time and even like big name producers and they go on social media and they make a big deal about it it's always like oh I have a relationship with you and you'll get me on the back end and it never happens that happens all the time Yeah. yeah I mean listen like I said all of all of those situations are directly correlated to what you negotiate up front and I would I would just say that in many cases, one of the most uncomfortable conversations to have, and unless you have an advocate or you have the wherewithal to have that conversation right there in the session, that uncomfortable conversation is, hey, what part of this record do I own? When do we get paid? How is it all going to be broken down? And where's the paperwork for it? It almost seems that antithetical to to the creative process, right? Because the creative process, you wanna be open, you wanna be open to ideas, people wanna be sharing back and forth. And the last element of uh, of that process is to be sitting back and saying, okay, what percentage of the song like, is like this a prenup. line? <laughs> like yeah. a prenup, messes up the love. Yeah. It's, it's, but it's, a, I, I just believe you, you get what you negotiate. Uh, and you may not even get what you deserve, you get what you negotiate, right? And That's so for me, I think that, uh, you know, we just have to get more comfortable with the discomfort and it that just needs to be a uh, a requisite of doing business and once you're at that level and you understand and folks that work with you understand that a requisite of doing business is to just have that upfront transparent conversation then once both sides agree then you allowed to run down on people for the money that's owed because there is no confusion uh in terms of having some sort of like you know fugazi conversation as opposed to having whatever you need to have in writing and so uh, you you get what you negotiate yeah so i'm imagining you know when you walk into these tables obviously you come from a highly educated background i think you you said your dad wanted you to study law is that true law (laughs) medicine you know whatever was a guaranteed pathway that somebody was going to get so did you did you feel when you sit at these tables obviously you you have a distinct uh advantage knowing that you know what they're not talking to somebody who's uneducated in this game listen i would say that baby and slim sitting at these tables they also had an advantage because they were moving a hundred thousand mixtapes a week Mm -hmm. so the education is the education comes in whatever format that you uh, achieve or the, uh, accumulate the education, right? Mm-hmm. So it's really up to you to to educate yourself. You know, you don't, I mean, I didn't go to Harvard for music business. I, I read it myself. And so I think that probably some of the most astute business people in the music business they learn from being observant they learn from having great relationships they learn from deciding that they wanted to be mentored by the best attorneys the best managers and they you know they had the transparency into the deals and so i think that you know nowadays like i said with with the with the amount of information that's readily accessible there's really no excuse for someone to enter into a deal blindly unless they intentionally just want to be ignorant about the deal Mm -hmm. and so i think that you know we live in an age of media where you can find anybody you can connect with anyone uh 
they may or may not respond, but you can at least reach out. You can ask for an in, an introduction. You can ask for a referral. You can ask for a recommendation, and you can go get the knowledge. And so you want to be great. Just be around the greatest, uh, and uh, and absorb as much knowledge as possible. And before you sit down at the table, make sure that you you've done your homework and your research, so that uh, even in the absence of knowing what you need to discuss, you can ask the right questions mm-hmm. so that people understand that you, you know, you're no slouch when you come to the, no- when you come to the negotiation table. So what is the, um, you said the, the royalty administrator company? Song Trust. What, what, Song what, can Trust. You, what, can you explain that? I never heard that before. Yeah, so basically, you know, you, you're getting whatever the streaming services are paying you. And at the same time, you're also entitled to a royalty as a, publisher of the music and a writer of the music and so those publishing and writing royalties have to be collected and administrated uh, by uh, for, for me the beauty of song trust is that those royalties are actually collected and administrated on your behalf in all of the countries and territories around the world so mm-hmm. that includes like okay you know what happens you know, you yeah, you get paid for your Spotify streams. What happens when your record makes it onto the radio in some obscure country? Or what happens when your record is actually being used in a video game? What happens when your record is actually being played in the nightclubs in, you know, some overseas country? All of that is actually being tracked, and there's a, there are a, a massive number of artists who completely overlook that as a revenue stream and so I think one of the greatest takeaways from my meeting recently like I said with with with, uh, downtown music holdings was that you know there are a number of creators who once they put their music through DistroKid or TuneCore they they get those checks and they think that's it Mm -hmm. when really there's an entire other world of of uh, publishing royalties that can be connected. You just need to hire an agency to do it. You give them a commission for doing it, and that becomes an additional income stream for you. So when you're talking about, I, I kind of think like when streaming, I can get how they track the data. Uh, when it's played on the radio, I understand how they can track the data. How does that happen in a nightclub? Like I'm not. Sure, you just turn work? like really for me. Every time I uh, every time I perform overseas, there they they are keeping track of the set list. So I even get paid to perform my own music. So like a DJ has to give the set list to the the venue. They give the set list, Got you. and the, and uh, you know in, in Europe I think it's called GEMA, G E M A. Okay. And yeah, they they track it the best that they can. You know. So <laughs> yeah. Bottom line is it's just an additional revenue stream, and and I think with the advancements in technology, that may or inevitably that will improve it's just going to get That's better crazy. Right? so like you can literally get booked for a nightclub get paid to go to the nightclub yeah and then if the dj starts yo ryan leslie's in the house and starts right. playing your records you can pay from that too absolutely okay. now obviously it's pennies on a dollar every second once, once once you do that once you do that uh at scale it starts to be, begin to become material and significant so as far as um the new age that we're in with um because we're going to talk about that in the next segment with the direct to consumer and all of that but for new new magicians artists uh, producers specifically where they're not going to the traditional route of going to a record label because now i've seen it from both sides where a lot of producers are mad at producers that's like selling beats for a hundred dollars like but they're getting their music out yeah. and then you know it's, it's easier route so what is what's your take on that for art for producers specifically that might be, I guess maybe devaluing yeah. their we, we saw work that happen or, with uh, Old Town Road, right? Like yeah. the dude sold the beat and he gave it to him for like two thousand dollars. Or even um, what's the kid um, Bobby Schmurder? Right. That was Lloyd Banks' beat, right? Originally. Who was that? Uh, Jaleel Beats. Jaleel Beats, right? Yeah. Same thing. But that it was that like record, a thousand dollars, something like that. Biggest record of the year, right? Yeah. Those, 10, 12 million times platinum. Trust me, th- those producers, as long as they retain their copyright ownership of those beats and I, I you know I also know Abe over at BeatStars those beats are actually being licensed and at least to my knowledge they're being licensed and yeah you give the license for some low barrier to entry cost so that you know some artist that doesn't have a lot of money but is very creative and could create the next Panda the next Old Town Road the yeah. next you know um, Bobby Schmurder Smash you license those beats, you retain the ownership though of the copyright and that's 
that's where that song trust relationship comes into play play because you're definitely going to get paid based on your ownership of that intellectual property i mean and so that's why like i said you just got to be astute about it and for for anyone that has you know that has time to be hating on how someone else is getting to their bag I always recommend, like, look, that means you got too much time on your hand. You should really just find another stream of income that you could go chase because, th- you know, everyone needs to make money the way they they feel is best for them. And uh, the impact uh, overall that that creates in the industry is it's just creating more and more opportunity for folks that want to make a living doing what they love they have the the right and they have the latitude to price that intellectual property however they want from a licensing perspective and you know when i was in when i was an undergrad at harvard i had a business school professor and i used to say oh man you know i don't want any uh, you don't want to hold on to all my music he said look ryan just hold on to your copyrights because the best thing that can ever happen to you is one of those songs just go whether someone paid you up front for it or not, as long as you own the copyright, you're getting paid. And you're gonna get paid handsomely as long as as you've done what you're supposed to do in terms of owning that copyright. So, well, that was a lot with the music. So now the next segment, we are gonna go into what you got going on now. All right, so now we are gonna go into the deep dive on the tech side. And um, this is something that we talked about a few different times. So. Derek Ferguson, Ferguson. Um, former bad boy C O O, right? Yep. C- yep, yep. CFO, CFO. Um, shout out to Derek, good guest, and he he was the first one to actually bring this up. Yeah. And then our guy Jabari from R and B Only talked about the data. Yep. Then we had Dana Chanel and um, Prince Donnell, and they both spoke about the same thing. Yep. So it's been a kind of recurrent theme on Earn Your Leisure, but but you have an actual platform in place, and so. 2013, I was watching the Breakfast Club interview. So 2013, you said um, you took your music off of streaming services, right? Right. Why'd you do that? Well, I needed to create an incentive for people to really want to connect with me directly. So, I mean, now you can go listen to my records on streaming services. At that time, though, I, I felt that that the, the most important, I would say, most important uh, factor or most important attractor or incentive for someone to connect with me directly would be through a conversation about music and new music. And so in order to build the audience that I wanted to build and in order to attract the audience that I wanted to attract and in order to accumulate the kind of data I wanted to accumulate, I needed to make sure that that audience was communicating with me directly because the convenience of iTunes, the convenience of Amazon, the convenience of Spotify uh, made it such that they really were just like, oh, okay, well, you know, I can just go listen to Ryan's music. Why I got to give him his, why I got to give him my cell phone number to, Mm. to listen to it. And so to take all the music off the streaming services, it gave me a way to differentiate between those that were passive Uh, interactions with me and uh, active interactions with me and I knew that I can convert the active interactions into um, into uh, a relationship of support and that support you know came to the tune of you know a two million dollar independent album cycle at that time uh, with no label no management no music videos just a short documentary around the project and so it was important to make sure that there was one exclusive hub where they could get the product and uh, that the gateway to that hub was for them to just simply introduce themselves so that for the first time instead of having an anonymous following I could actually have uh, a following where every single interaction had a name an email a phone number a city a birthday associated with that yeah because a lot of times you hear people say we have hardcore fans right but they just go to shows and like maybe there's 15,000 people in a city you leave that city, you have no idea. You don't know any of them unless they pay for a package and they met you backstage or something like that. Right. That doesn't happen. Even if you sold records, like there's yeah. no, there was no way to track. Like, hey, Tanisha from Pennsylvania, yeah. like she bought my album when yeah. I, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So like, your mindset going in was like, let me find the core core base and then, and make an advantage of that off of that. Yeah, I mean that's that's the foundation of any great business. That's the foundation of any great audience. Is who is your core? Your core 
not only are they going to be your greatest supporters, they will also be your greatest evangelists. And so when you have a relationship with both your greatest supporters and greatest evangelists, then that therefore creates uh, the the kind of uh, the kind of foundation for growth and scale uh, that I think every single business, whether you're a personal business, whether you're in financial services, whether you're selling insurance, whether you're doing business development for a startup, when you have that core and that core is pleased with your product or service, and that core is also evangelizing for you. They're going to bring you referrals, and then you scale that exact flywheel. And I, you know, anyone that studied Amazon understands sort of that flywheel concept. That flywheel starts to starts to starts to work, and that's where you get the kind of Amazon scale. And I believe that that should be applicable to anyone that's starting a business. And I would say uh, the ability to manage that is even more possible when the scale is small. So mm. when you're first starting, you should really just be enjoying the opportunity and the luxury, if you will, of having that kind of relationship with just your first 20 customers, your first 200 customers, your first 5,000 customers. At the scale of Jeff Bezos, let's be real, he actually knows what all of us are doing on Amazon. And at the same time, he only knows that when he's able to log in and actually pull up that record. Same, same for let's call it Delta Airlines. Same for uh, Facebook. You know, yeah, they they, they they can definitely see your activity. Mm -hmm. The reason why I like the Delta Airlines example is because Delta's data about you is really, I would say, it, it's very specific to their business relationship with you, right? Amazon and Facebook, I would say, you know, the reason why they they've ended up in in Congress and ended up with a lot of questions is because, you know, are they collecting more data than they need to have that business relationship with you? The reason why I love Delta is that Delta just knows, OK, my relationship, my business relationship with Ryan Leslie is uh, is based on him flying, whether it's flying on, you know, chartered aircraft, Delta private jets, Sky Access, or, you know, Diamond Medallion member or Million Mile or whatever it is. And they keep their data really focused on the business relationship with me and how to serve me better. Now, in the in the in defense of, of uh, Jeff Bezos or Mark Zuckerberg, they also believe that they need to collect more data to better serve their audiences. So they need to know, hey, Ryan doesn't like this, so I'm not going to serve him ads that look like this. Same with Google. Mm -hmm. Or, That's what um, saying that, Google. yeah, yeah, R R Ryan doesn't like this, so I'm not going to recommend this to him on Amazon. The tricky part is when, you know, is your Echo device listening to you? Is your you know Apple device there's listening 1, to you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, one thousand percent. No, right? that's definitely there's, a, there's gotta be a mic in the phone. I'm telling you, like there'll be conversations, and it won't even be me talking about it. I could be in the room with somebody, and let's right. say they're talking about getting a new oven. Like right. I'm telling you, like I go to my phone and the first ad will be like a Best Buy. Nah, but the right. crazy, the crazy thing is like, the, the, the not to go off topic, but really not off topic. The crazy thing that happened to me when I really started to get scared about technology is that I was on the phone. I think I might've been on the phone with you, Troy. And we, I was talking about something like, let's say like a vacation in Jamaica, something like that, right? But on my phone. So after the conversation, I'm verbally talking about this. I go on my laptop, which is a complete, it's not an Apple device at all. It's like a Toshiba. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> I go is. on Google and it's like a vacation for Jamaica thing mm -hmm. that pops up. So I'm like, how did that transfer from my iPhone to mm -hmm. a Toshiba laptop in five minutes? Like, mm -hmm. same router. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah. How did that happen? Yeah. So, I mean, listen, the fact that the largest technology companies are doing this at scale, and when we talk about at scale, Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram, managing hundreds of millions of people, that for me is just an indicator that A, the technology exists for relationship management at mm -hmm. scale, so the technology already exists, and B, for someone that has any level of ingenuity, that technology can be leveraged on a personal and business level no matter the scale of your business. So what that means is, as long as Google, as long as WhatsApp, as long as Instagram, as long as Dropbox can have six, seven hundred million, maybe a billion users 
and it's all managed. And when you log into your Gmail account, it's not mixed in with somebody else's email. It's all your, it's all very well organized. When you log into your Google Drive, it's all well organized. The fact that the technology infrastructure exists, the fact that the technology infrastructure is now being productized, so a lot of your favorite businesses are running on Amazon Web Services. Mm -hmm. AWS. So whatever Amazon is using to run their back end, you can also just subscribe to that service and run your back end that way. So my, my excitement for this, especially for our community, is as long as you have the ingenuity, like I said, and you have the vision and you have the blueprint, because the blueprint's already been laid, here's how you actually can manage 600 million people, then they're really, once again, the only limitation is really you. The only limitation is how great of a team can you put together? The only limitation is how big is your vision? The only limitation is um, how great are the relationships you could put around you to believe in your vision? And so, you know, we watched Steve Stout go out to uh, Silicon Valley and raise 70 million to make the record company of the future. We watched, you know, two yeah. kids from Brazil who built the PayPal of Brazil come and build a credit card company called Brex, turn it into a $1.1 billion business in two years, teenagers right? Teenagers, too. And so, yeah, t you know, teenagers, teenagers yeah. right? And so that's what I'm saying is for us as a community, it's important to A, understand that the knowledge exists and the information is just readily available and it's abundant. Number two, though, is the limitation that you place on yourself is going to be directly correlated to the kind of impact and change that you actually can make in the world. And so I believe that it's, it's time for us. You know, people always say, hey, you should dream big. I'm saying dream bigger. I'm saying that... Um, as long as Amazon can be what it has become, then whoever is coming next, because of the speed of technology, they're going to be able to build the Amazon or the Facebook or the Google or the Instagram of the future in half the time or a quarter of the time. They just need to A, have a vision that's big enough and B, be very intentional around the relationships that they build around the actual vision and those people have to buy into that vision. And that could be, you know, your vision for yourself as a music artist, yeah. your vision for yourself as an entrepreneur, your vision for yourself as a, a software developer, as a medical doctor, as an astronaut, whatever your vision is, you've got to put great people around you, the best people around you, because the best people actually attract one another mm -hmm. because they're all united in this concept that they want to impact the world in the same way that you do, which is on the greatest scale. Yeah, I, I think that's one of the things that um, you kind of preach, and I love it. It's like there's a bunch of people over here that have the ideas. They just need to find the people with the capital to help them get the, out those ideas. And relationships is something that you're big on, right? And, and, and that's what, I mean, pretty much Superphone is based off of that. Right. And I know you have this this pyramid of uh, in, the, the pyramid, yeah, pyramid of, of intimacy, intimacy. Yeah. relationships. Yeah. I, I'm interested because in the pyramid, you start with obviously the, at the bottom of the list, social media. Right. Why is that? Well, I would say that social media is, is almost like a virtual representation of walking around the streets of New York, right? So anyone that you see on the streets of New York or riding the trains or however you're walking around New York, you actually do have the option of speaking to them. Right. Okay. So you could be in Times Square, and you know, it's ten, twenty thousand people in Times Square. As long as they're standing there and walking the same street with you, you have the option of speaking with them. Mm -hmm. Whether they're going to speak to you is up to them. New York. You have the, <laughs> you you have the op you have the option. Right. Same on the internet. Right. Social media, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, whatever social platform you're on. As long as they're there and they're sharing you also have the option of reaching out and speaking to them, whether it's through a direct message, whether it's in a comment, whether it's in a retweet or reply, whatever it is, they obviously have the option of whether they would like to respond. The connectivity is there. So uh, I would say the expected response, and that's why you just say, oh, in New York, because there's already, <laughs> right. there's built, a stigma there. There, there, it's already built in the expected response time. So. Once you start on social media and you're basically, and that's basically a, 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 a virtual representation of what's happening in the world, if you're just walking around, the expected response time or the expectation for a response is very low, mm -hmm. right? Once you can move up 
and you actually can get an email address. Yeah. That expectation for a response goes up a little bit higher. Yeah. So I, you went social media. I think you said yeah. DMs, and then yeah. now we're at email. Right. So you get from DMs to email. The beauty of email as well is the fact that nine times out of ten, when you get someone's email, you've been introduced by someone. So you say, like, just how I said, hey, put me in touch with your guy from 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 the R and B, and he's doing texting. I'm going to get a warm introduction. So it's not just me reaching out. Randomly. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm getting a warm introduction on email, right? That can also happen on text. What I like about text, though, is the fact that text allows you to turn up from texting to a phone conversation mm -hmm. very quickly. And when you have that kind of rapport, you're really going to see who wants to work with you yeah. when you can take stock of who actually answers your phone call, especially in 2020. Yeah. Who's actually going to answer the phone call, right? And then that continues up the pyramid. Okay, yo, we had a phone call. Hey, look, why don't you pull up at this time? You got that in person, and then you continue moving up the pyramid from there. So, yeah. I want to talk about Superphone, but before that, I wanted to go back to the. You said you made $2 million after off that. Um, album when you took it off so can you detail like how did you do that was it through your merch was it through live shows a combination of everything yeah. like, what's live 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 made up the majority live shows yeah so so when i put my number on twitter and say hey everybody shoot me a text there were thirty five thousand people that texted in the first response that everyone got and whether you're texting with you know you texting me for the first time or you see any of these other celebs i mean they now six seven years later everybody finally <laughs> caught on you know what i'm saying Visionary. But the, fir the first response is it needs to be automated right and so for you to be able to to manage the scale and that first response is always thanks for texting i would love to know who you are so please, you know, put your information in my phone, right? Because I'm not going to type everybody's information. Yeah. Yeah. So here's a form you can you can actually put your information in my phone, so I know who's even texting me. At that point, th the difference I would say between my 2013 campaign and the campaigns that I'm seeing now is that there was a very specific intent captured at the initiation of the conversation. So I didn't just say, hey, here's my number, shoot me a text, what's up? I said, look, shoot me a text to get my new album. So they shot me a text. I already know the reason they're texting is to get they my want, new they album. They want the product. What's your information? Once I have the information, here's a link to get the album. Once that intent is captured, then you have an incredibly high conversion rate. So one out of every two, about 17,000 people actually bought that record. They bought it for $10. That's 170000 right? The difference, though, is that I now have a Rolodex, a record, a ledger of every single person that's willing to actually spend money with me directly. So now, not only do I have names, not only do I have emails, not only do I have telephone numbers, I have city and state and country information. Mm -hmm. So now I'm going on tour. You got the real goal. You're going on tour, people go to concerts because it is a social experience. So, yeah, you might go to the concert if none of your friends want to go, you still figure out a way you go by yourself, but you're still in a room with a bunch of people. You guys are connected by the fact that you appreciate the artist that's on stage. For me, in that situation, even though only 17,000 people in my phone actually bought my record, they all brought a friend or two or three or five to the concerts when I announced them. We sold 40,000 tickets, 60 euros a ticket. <laughs> you could do the math that's there. like five albums right there <laughs> right? Voila. you know and so it's really just and like i said it, it, you know there's obviously ancillary income that happens from that there's publishing Merch, revenue stuff. and yeah. merchandise etc for me you know I, I i really prefer digital goods um because you know there's a cost of goods you know when you have merchandise mm -hmm. and there's a cost of inventory there's a cost of shipping and so digital goods for me have always been my preference uh just because they have unlimited scale and uh as long as you're delivering value hopefully your content is going to be evergreen and so that's why i always i always um remind an artist that even though you may feel like your music is is outdated to you it's actually brand new for the person who's hearing it for the first time and the reality is that 
even if you went platinum, there is still a large number of people around the world who have yet to have even heard your record <laughs> yeah. one time. <laughs> so you have the ability uh, in music, which is always why I say, look, just create the best music you possibly can because great music is evergreen, you know? And so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing some real estate uh, development um, uh, and investments in, in Brooklyn. And so, you know, sometimes you'll walk into some of the, whether it's the mom and pop stores or, or just the bodegas or wherever, and they'll be playing some great, you know, old school music. I'd never heard the record before. I'm putting my Shazam up. Because for me, it's still that experience of discovering that music for the first, first time. time. Yep. It's 30, 40 years old, you I, know? I love what you said as far as, like, how many people don't know you. Um, because that happened, I, I realized that, like, now with the podcast, it's become very popular, especially in our community. And we went to an event, Curl Fest. I don't know if you've heard of it, but, um, yeah, one, yeah um, one of our guests on the podcast, a friend of ours, she does it. So we had Curl Fest this year, and it's like 20,000 women. And um, not a lot of men. And uh, <laughs> like at least probably like 20, 20 um, people came up to us like, yo, we love your podcast. So, so at first I'm like, this is dope. Like we feel like, you know, we made it. Right. But then I'm thinking, <laughs> all right, 20 people recognized us, right. which is dope. But there's 20,000 people right, here. Yeah, like exactly. how many people, we still got so much right. more I tell to penetrate. Every day. I tell yeah. them every day, like I, I, my life is, is so much duality. Like I go to work. Most of my coworkers don't even know I do a podcast. Right. I walk down the street. Most people don't even know I'm a teacher. Mm -hmm. But like, there are rare cases. Like we're in Houston, Ian. Somebody will say, "Oh, yo, I love your podcast." It's right. like, all right, this is cool. But yeah. like, no, nah, we got so it much just shows further you to the, go. The, the yeah. penetration. You can yeah. never get caught yeah. thinking that you like made it because yeah. there's always a bunch of people that don't yeah. know who have you are. no clue yeah. who you are. Yeah, and also just to be just to keep it a hundred, you still can be ridiculously wealthy just from a niche audience. You know. Um, I would say that you know there 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 exists a number of Gen Zers that may not even know who Oprah is, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. That's a fact. The audience though that she's created, that's her niche audience, and that's a that's a loyal audience, and that audience is not just limited to the viewers; it's also limited to the television executives that love her content and want to syndicate it, right? And so I think that uh, you know. The I would say the conundrum of scale or the dilemma, if you will, of scale is unless you really have the technological infrastructure to have a direct relationship with each one of your listeners at scale, you're better off having a manageable a manageable audience in terms of size so that you can actually have a depth of a relationship with those folks. I have yeah. folks, uh, you know, you look at my socials, my socials compared to the, the biggest uh, stars or influencers on Instagram, I'm, I'm sitting at 360,000 followers. I know that in my core though, I have folks that have spent four, five, six, seven, ten thousand dollars $10,000 with me, and I know every dollar they spent, I know the products they like, et cetera. And so, you know, that depth of relationship on, it, and, and that's sort of in any, uh, in any vertical, in any circumstance, the depth of relationship is always going to yield, I would say, just a greater reward in general. Yeah, sometimes less is more. Less is more. A yeah. lot of times less yeah. is more. And this, yeah. is, this is a prime example of it. Yeah. Uh, so I, I know you get emails and yeah. you get texts, yeah. but you're, you're so adamant about the text. Yeah. And the percentages show, like, I think you, you go down and you said, like, 22% of people, you know, actually, when they get an email, open it and go to it, whereas when people get a text message, even if you you sent it and they didn't read it, you know they got it. Yeah. How are we tracking that data? Yeah, I, I mean, for me, I, I track I track based on uh, whatever the call to action is in the text that I send. So for me, you know, once again, I capture intent on the way in. So let's just take, for example, a case in point. I did a 10th anniversary concert uh, for uh, my debut and sophomore albums. In December. Right? Yep. And so... The easiest way for me to track intent was, hey, are you interested in coming to my concert? Or just RSVP here. There's no barrier of payment. How many tickets would you like? This is how much the tickets cost. How many VIP tickets would you like? This is how much they cost. What songs do you want me to play? That creates a beautiful capture of intent right at the beginning of the conversation. And so I know these are the songs that you like. I know how many VIP tickets. I know how many general admission tickets you want. And then when I deliver on that 
request, I know that there's going to be a very high engagement. And so I'm I'm tracking based on link clicks. So okay. I will literally once somebody first and foremost somebody comes through that form, I don't need to send them a link to fill out a form because they already you just did. RSVP through yeah. a form. So now all I all now I know that all I need to do is deliver on the request, and the request is I want to come to your concert. So send them a link. I can track whether or not they click that link. And then once they're actually in my e-commerce ecosystem, I can track whether or not they actually purchase. And whether they purchase or not, I have a direct line of communication so I can ask them what is the reason. Well, I'm going to be out of town. Or, hey, it's Christmas time, so I've decided, like, I would definitely love to come to the concert, but I need to get XYZ gifts, etc. Mm. That kind of context around even the non-purchases is priceless information and it's now all stored in my phone in that text conversation. I would say the the nuance between email and text conversations is a very obvious and simple one. Every time you get an email from someone, it's a new thread. When you get a text from someone as long as it's from the same number, that thread is the same and it's consistent and it's continuous until they either change their number, block you, or pass <laughs> away. Uh, unsubscribe. Um, yeah, something like that. Nah, yeah, e- yeah. I feel like emails, especially me, like I get so many emails and it's like I, I might check my emails like five times a day, mm-hmm. but I'm on my phone all day. So yeah. if somebody texts me, odds are I'm going to see it. Yeah. Whereas an email, you might get an email and then you might get, you know, wrapped up in some stuff and you might right. not even get tra- you lose track and never even catch yeah. it. Yeah. So um, it happens with text too. I know. Yeah, you know, that, that fo- does. Fo- it does. a lot of people. It does. Here, it does. But, but it's easier to, to track text than it is email. So Right now. Right now. Yeah. And so that's really where, that's really where Superphone steps in. At some point in time, all of the traffic that you're having on email will eventually start to permeate and make its way into your text message feed. The challenge with today's text message feed is that we have iPhone 11 and we're still using iMessage 1. There's no folders, there's no automation, there's no mark a message as unread, there's no, yo, remind me to respond to this message later after work. All of that is missing And yet we have emojis, we got virtual reality, we got augmented reality, people running around in Central Park looking for Pokemon. (laughs) The bottom line is, where is the innovation in that feed, which is potentially our most important form of human communication? And so that's really where I'm sitting uh, at the helm of Superphone and saying, look, at first we're going to enable businesses. We're going to enable, you know, whether you are a, a whether you are uh, an Earn Your Leisure podcast and you have 200,000 people or you're a masseuse or a yoga instructor or you, you, you sell cupcakes or you're a florist and you just have, you know, 20 or 15 clients. How do we make you more efficient in this ecosystem of text? at least on your side. The folks that you're interacting with, they don't need to download an app, they just need to know that you never miss a birthday, you never miss an anniversary, you never, and they never miss out when you have a sale, a promotion, an event. That's the first relationship that we're going to build and we're going to uh, power. Then what's going to happen is, all of a sudden, all of these consumers are gonna give their numbers to all of these businesses because it's more convenient. And then at that point, there will need to be inbox management for your tech speed in the same way that inbox management is for a necessity email. for email. And so for me, I'm, I'm just sitting here and like I said, look, you know, what I was doing in 2013, it took seven years for folks, six, seven years for folks to catch up. Now I'm sitting, you know, and looking towards the future and saying, okay, these are the problems of the future that I know are inevitable. They are impending challenges that are going to need to be solved. And how am I building a product and productizing the solutions that I envision so that they are turnkey and they're accessible and they're affordable? Because by the time your inbox gets flooded, you won't even have recognized that you've given your number to all these people. And I know this is going to happen because this is what happened with email. No, and it's actually, I'm glad you said that because if anybody's listening, don't take it personal. I've been getting a lot of text messages and emails <laughs> lately. And, it, and I actually, I always pride myself on being like very organized. Right. But now, especially with the podcast, my business, my personal life, I'm becoming, it's, it's becoming overwhelming. Right. And 
a lot of times you get a text and it's like you you mean to text somebody back and then before you know it it's five days later and it's like oh damn but then people take it personal right yeah. like yo I text you right. I know you saw it and then right. when they see you it's like yo I, I yeah. text you yeah. right. <laughs> so right. so Superphone is is it an app it's an app and it's really, is it automated it it'll you can automate or you can automate as much or as little as you want. So you make the messages, right? So like, yeah. Ryan Leslie, on my birthday, you're gonna text me. You can choose to say, you know what, yo, Troy, happy birthday. Yeah. Yo, glad to see you last yep. week at the concert. Yeah, and I can send it as a voice note too. So you know, for somebody that writes in and says, "Yo, Ryan, it's my birthday," I could just literally press a button and it'll send like, "Yo, happy birthday from your boy Ryan," and it will also log that that's a birthday. So if I want to do that every year forever I can do that every year now people have always you know made fun of me because they say okay once you set that up what happens when you you pass away you, you still gonna be texting people <laughs> happy birthday after you you know what I'm saying in heaven hey, beyond Troy, the grave you know this is Jesus and right, Ryan exactly yeah <laughs> have a great one brother I'll see you up here soon can't right? wait to see you when right, you get here right. <laughs> so so Superphone is, is is a management it's a management system yes it's uh it's inbox management for inbox text management. and it's 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 enterprise right now some of your favorite favorite New York companies are using it. Some of your favorite fashion companies are using it. Obviously, I'm sure you've seen, you know, a ton of celebrities giving their phone numbers mm -hmm. out, et cetera, following yeah. that pathway. Uh, but for us, we're really focused on, like I said, that next wave. And that next wave is every element and feature and aspect of Gmail that allows you to organize email at the scale that you have it, and even if it's just a personal use of email, mm -hmm. your scale is crazy just by nature of the services you've signed up for, uh, interest that you might have in somebody's music, interest in a podcast, interest in, in a product, uh, interest in a crowdfunding, interest in whatever it is, your email is crazy right now. My prediction is that your text message feed is eventually gonna get there, and the folks who, once again, are adopting technology to help them to be more efficient and manage this at scale and adopting that technology early, those are the folks who have that arbitrage opportunity to really profit. And when I say profit, that means both in time, relationships, and money because you have a better handle on the most important form of human communication, which right now is that text feed. Yo, in 2013, obviously you changed the game, right? And I'm thinking now, right, 2020, now that everybody's catching on to what you were trying to tell them, like they probably thought, yo, he's tripping, what is he doing? Mm -hmm. What is that feeling like? Are you just like so focused on the future that it's like, you know what, I'm glad y'all caught up, but I'm on to the next thing. Yeah, I mean, I think you can already just hear it in my tone. I think that, uh, I think that is great for people to catch up. I think that is great for innovation to finally start reaching that sort of mass adoption because it's important it's uh it's uh it's required for us to be able to fix the sort of large scale issues that we're having i mean we talk about climate change we're talking about you know uh breakouts of viruses we're talking about uh trade wars and so the bottom line is that for us to be able to even live in peace with one another we need to be able to adopt this kind of innovation and it's important for visionaries and futurists and technologists to anticipate the problems that we're going to have the challenges that we're going to have and create turnkey solutions for them i mean I, I, as it stands right now i, I could go all over the world and uh i never have an issue getting a car from point a to point b it took a group of folks who were having that issue to say, hey, we're gonna solve that mm -hmm. with ride sharing, mm -hmm. right? And so for me, I am, like I said, I'm just anticipating, I'm like, look, I'm glad you guys caught up. We're gonna have a major epidemic here where people just going, their phones, are just, you're gonna get promoter text messages. I mean, you probably are getting promoter text messages yeah. already, yeah. right? Yeah. You're gonna get promoter text messages, you're gonna have your doctor, your dentist texting you, you're gonna have your grocery store texting you, you have Amazon deliveries, they're already texting you, you have your bank texting you, you have your family texting you, if you got a business, you have your customers texting you. I message one. That's really how you plan on, on efficiently managing that at scale. I'm already knowing from the seat that I'm in right now on this podcast, that the future is going to be a smart inbox management system. And as long as I have that vision, 
I can, with my team, build that solution way before the problem or the challenge gets out of hand. And that's why I'm saying those that adopt the solution now are going to have the advantage of, uh, I would say, uh, leveraging and profiting from their ingenuity because you, you're just going to be that many more steps ahead of anyone else that's trying to manage it manually. There you have it. So that was a lot of gems right there. So we're going to head into the last segment. We're going to take it home. We're going to talk about wealth plan and um, some other stuff as well. All right. So we're going to talk about a lot of cool things. But before we start, I wanted to, um, we was huge fans, rest in peace, of Nip before he passed away. Um, went to his concert in New York, got his album and all that. But I see that you actually helped him out as far as business. A lot of people look at him as like, you know, his business intellect. And so his his mixtape, everybody knows about the Crenshaw mixtape. He mm-hmm. dropped for $100, Proud to Pay campaign. But then he had another mixtape where he dropped for $1,000, and that right. was on your platform, correct? Right. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, really it was just his, his uh, like I said, just the ingenuity of recognizing a replicable pathway to success. And so for me... I was, like I said, I was doing the direct-to-consumer. Uh, Nip, in my opinion, has always just been one of those minds that was a sponge for knowledge. And so, you know, it was actually my guy, Nathan McCartney, that put us together. And, you know, shout-out Steve Carlos. I mean, shout-out the whole um, All Money In team, uh, George Panice, DJ VIP, all those guys, man. We had a great time, man. You know, I took him out to uh, uh, show him around Paris, um, and you know, just showed 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 him just the power of what technology could do for for the audience that he was already building at that time, and the relationship that he was already building. So I mean, it was just kind of a no brainer. Uh, once we sat down and broke bread, and you know, I remember um, my guy Slow. He actually put together a brunch. Uh, me, Nipsey, uh, Wilson Chandler, uh, just to talk about, you know other ventures that we wanted to get into, startup investing, venture investing, um, technology, film and television, health, you know, the yeah, documentary that you, he was gonna do. You guys yeah. introduced him to Bitcoin too, right? Yeah, so definitely, you know, that that was that was a conversation. He said, yo, Ryan, what's the next topic? I said, yo, crypto. He said, okay, I'm on it, you know? Uh, we we have a, a crazy story about crypto. We'll talk about that another time. Though. Why, wait, <laughs> why we gotta talk about another nah, time? What's the story? We, nah, we lost, lot of, we lost some money. Um, why, why, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> Come on now, yeah. people wanna learn from the mistakes, Yeah, man. yeah, we, oh, yeah. so yeah. Had, we was in Asia. We did a whole okay. episode about this, but we was in Asia, <laughs> Right. me and Jamal, and um, we went there, we took a sabbatical for 30 days. Okay. And at that time, that was like when crypto was going crazy. Okay. And um, 2017? Yeah. 2017. Okay. November, November 2017. Wow. You left December 1st. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, we was in, uh, I, I was in Litecoin, Ethereum, and Bitcoin. Okay. And I just put money in and, and I went to Asia. And as I'm in Asia, that's when it just starts going crazy. Every okay. day I'm making like $1,000 a day. Right. So I'm telling them, I'm the only one that invested out of all my friends. Okay. And I'm telling everybody in the group chat, I'm like, <laughs> I'm sending them screenshots on Coinbase. Like, yeah. look, look how much money I made today. Like, it's like, I feel like I'm on top of the world. I'm like, I'll make a million dollars by summer. Right. So I locked it they in. still kind of like a little nervous about it. And I'm just, I'm putting more money in. And it just keeps going up, keeps going up. So then they decided to lock in. Troy, like, locked himself <laughs> in his basement. And then he <laughs> started finding all these altcoins. Okay. And he's telling me about this guy named Justin Sun who got a coin named Tron. Right. I'm like, I don't really don't know. I just stay in my lane, man. I'm right. doing I got a nice thing with Bitcoin. You talk right. about all this alternative stuff. Right. Yeah. I told him come home. I said, yo, listen, I don't care what y'all doing. Get on the flight, come back. Right. I found something. Okay. So, nobody was talking about all coins at okay. the time. It was okay. just like Bitcoin. Everybody thought right. cryptocurrency was Bitcoin. Right. And then I saw all these all I'm like, yo, bro, this like 900 different coins. Right. Yeah. So then I saw Justin Sun. I'm like, yo, I'm going to follow that. Yeah. Right. So he said Justin Sun. And I never really trusted Justin Sun because yeah, you I know see why? You know why? <laughs> no, it was weird. He, he, did, a Periscope, no, he did a Periscope <laughs> video. I promise you. We was watching him on Periscope. And he, um, he blew his nose and yeah, wiped his, his eyes. Yeah, he was doing, he was, and we was like, yo, we can't trust anybody like, who do that. I don't know about this guy. He's like, no, nah, no, nah, trust me. He's a genius. Da, da, da. Yeah. I'm like, all right, whatever. So I put some money in Tron. And then Tron goes from two cents to 28 cents or something like that. It was right. crazy. Right. It was like four tenths of a cent. To yeah, it was going crazy. Right. So I'm like, okay. So now it's like all money. In. So now we're staying up <laughs> all night. Nobody's sleeping. Looking at all these altcoins mm-hmm. and master nodes. It became like cryptocurrency mm-hmm. experts. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and making money and hand over feet. fish. Mm-hmm. And then it started to fall. And then February came. Right. And then it was like, all right, 
Let me just, just hold, hold on. on. Hold on. <laughs> hold on. Hold on. Hold on for dear life. I'm, I'm happy we can laugh about it. No, but then, it. Then, it, then, it, then it crashed crazy. Yeah. But then they said, buy the dip. Right. Oh, <laughs> they said, buy the dip. So I put more money in. Wow. Then it crashed again. It's like, wow. buy the dip again. Wow. And then it just, everything yeah. that I made, I lost. And then I lost more money on top of that. And The plane is still landing. Still have but we, we, we still on the still plane. Still haven't recovered We still on the plane. I still got money in You're the crypto. Holding, though, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm holding. Please. Wait, wait. Hold, hold, hold it for dear life. H-O-D-L, right? Hold, like, hold, H-O-D-L. Yeah, hold, <laughs> hold it for dear life. So right. that's that's the crypto that's a good yeah. story. Yeah, I, I I have a much different uh, story. <laughs> yeah, you got. So I mean, that's, that's the thing. Like you've been seeing the future for a long time. You, I, I read. I, you right. got into Bitcoin in its early stages. Yeah, because it, yeah. it it started around. Uh, for me, it started around music. When uh-huh. when when they were trying to crack down on people getting free music, they started having payments that you couldn't track. Mm-hmm. And so one of the ways you could pay was Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. And that's the first time I ever heard about. it. I never mm-hmm. thought about it again. Right. But you were in there early, 20, man. 2013. So I was already had a, a BitPay integration with my Shopify store. And uh, it was actually Ben Horowitz, who was the first uh, mm. in, investor in Superphone, introduced me to uh, Brian and Fred, who were the founders of Coinbase. And uh, Brian actually uh, gave me uh, he gave me $5 worth of Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> and that's 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 all I needed. I was like, okay, oh, this is it. God. You know what I mean? <laughs> and that was it. And so I literally, you know, that that whole uh, that whole uh, that was a crazy season. Ride, huh? That whole season, I was literally, you know, people were like, I was like, yo, I'm not performing unless I'm getting paid. At this point. <laughs> <laughs> what is that? I was like, look, just figure it out, man. But here's my here's my wallet address. You know what I mean? <laughs> no and, yeah, yeah, you know, that gets tricky too. And, yeah, <laughs> and so you know. Um, you know, shout out my my uh, m- literally one of my my dearest friends. You know, he he really was I would say largely responsible for a lot of the innovation that uh, that I've come to to appreciate and, and come to see early in technology. Rashid Richmond, uh, and you know he he has he has two um, currencies right now, Light Cash. Uh, which he's always sending me the screenshots, you know, up 130%, up 500%. And so, you know, basically, I, I think that, you know, you guys did what you were <laughs> supposed to do in terms of being as uh, as astute as you possibly could be in terms of being students uh, and learning as much as possible yeah. and also learning on, you know, <laughs> Harsh on, on those slippery slopes <laughs> on the way down, right? Uh, and so, you know, he, he, he basically taught himself... Um, and, and 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 launched a coin and once you can build a community of miners and you can actually get listed on an exchange there's real value i think though it's important to really understand that uh you know bitcoin is really like a, a stored value and i'm just talking about bitcoin but really it's all cryptocurrency really a, it's like a stored value instrument mm-hmm. and it being a stored value instrument you know it's at at some t- at some point uh you know people are actually more inclined to hold, right? Because of stored value. So it's almost like gold, right? They're, they're holding. And, you know, there are varying viewpoints on cryptocurrency. I mean, you know, one of the greatest investors in the world is, is you know, very vehemently and vocally a non-believer of crypto, Warren Buffett. Mm-hmm. He's just yeah. like, look, man, this yeah. is, what That's, is this, <laughs> you know? Um, but at the same time, it's, it's always just about understanding and recognizing uh, recognizing the the upside and you know <laughs> capturing that upside before before it's before, over yeah before the but you know what my personal is, opinion yeah. i think if it, i believe in anything i believe in bitcoin because bitcoin really hasn't fought it's like was like nine thousand right now yeah it got it, a, no, a, it's ten, it ten thousand three hundred bitcoin never really right like yeah. those other coins lost like 98 percent like yeah. neo yeah <laughs> Neo. Shout out to Neo. Neo. Oh, right. I was involved in I had so many coins. Yeah, man. we had security, just, Bitcoin cash. All these security right. coins. I became right. like, I'm telling you, in three weeks, I became a crypto. We knew them all, man. We knew the security coins. I knew the privacy coins. Dash. Dash. Monero. Monero. We was really in that. Yeah. Jamal over there, he know what's up. Ah, man, I'm telling you, man. That was heavy. Yeah. The master note thing, we thought we really had something. No, the master note. That was. We had like a meeting at your house, remember? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sunday. But yeah, but Bitcoin is still kind (laughs) of, I think, if anything is going to survive, Bitcoin is going to be here for the future. Yeah. And um, once you start seeing regulation, that's when you know, like, okay, the powers that be are recognizing the need and feel like they need to get involved 
then you know that there's enough of a mass adoption that there is some real tangible value there. And so, yeah, I mean, I've, I've you know, getting it at like two, 200 a coin at Bitcoin, you know. So even to, to actually ride through that, you know, the height of 2017, I'm looking at my account like felt like he was <laughs> selling heroin. Right? So I feel like you were selling heroin. That's yeah. how I was yeah, feeling. Like, yo, we're like, gonna stop all this music. Nah, <laughs> it felt like it, it felt like it was a whole different game being played out there, man. Yeah, we right. we seen people. But what made comes money. up must come down. Yeah. <laughs> so speaking of speaking of the financial um topic, you have wealth plan, right? Right. So what is that? What 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 encouraged you to get into the financial literacy space as far as that's concerned? Yeah. I'm 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 charged up about this concept that uh, by 2040, the majority of the United States population will be mi minorities, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And at the same time, there's only, I think the last statistic, really about 3% of us that are, that are in technology and innovation as a career. Mm -hmm. And that's, that could be for a variety of reasons. Maybe we just like singing and dancing and rapping and you know or maybe we just like athletics and well, there's, yeah, there's the plenty idea, of money to that's be the made there. Exposure, exposure, also. exposure also that's the, yeah. right exposure. so the issue though for me is that at least you know in terms of some of the conversations i've been having especially for minorities we always it always seems as though we're one step behind in terms of our adoption of where the world is going. So, yeah, you know, everyone started out as farmers, then moved on to industrial, and we were still farmers, right? Mm -hmm. Then industrial moved on to service and hospitality, and we were still working on the railroad, right? And then uh, service moved on to technology, and we're still in the service business. And when I talk about service, look around. Who's cleaning the houses? Who's cleaning the office buildings? Who's doing the you know services, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas there has already been a shift to technology, and even in venture investing, you know, shout out my guy, uh, Richard Kirby from Equal Ventures. He just, you know, raised a fifty-six million dollar fund. Shout out my guys over at Harvard, at Harlem Capital. We had them on. We had John Henry on the podcast. Yeah, so yeah. you know, um, my guys over there, uh, Base Ventures, Paul Judge, you know, there, you know, um, Robert Smith. I think you know, a really big, uh, a, a, a really big force in terms of uh, finance uh, and investing, private equity, right? Yeah. And so. I feel like there should be more names. I feel like there should be more superstars in that world and in that pathway, in that archetype, just because I feel like, A, like you said, it's about exposure. What what example do, what example does the next generation really have in terms of that pathway? And also, how do, how do we frame wealth, right? Is wealth a million dollars? Is wealth... Two million dollars? Is it five hundred million? Is it is it a billion? Is it you know we got folks talking about Elon Musk going to be a trillionaire? You know Apple's got a trillion dollars worth of cash or market valuation? You know so I think that um, it's just important. I you know I've had too many conversations with folks that either come into my organization that are either mentees of mine, employees of mine who literally will tell me straight to my face, hey, I don't even look at my accounts because I don't like what I see. You don't look at your accounts? <laughs> no, I don't even look at my accounts because I don't like what I see. And I'm I'm hoping that I get the big break. You know, I'm hoping that as a creative, you know, I get the big campaign or I get the big record deal or I get the big athletics contract. And the reality, though, is that um, with calculated, measured moves, you really can, with the right kind of saving and budgeting and paying yourself and making sure that your assets are allocated the right way, you can guarantee as, as long as you start early that you retire with a million dollars right and so for me you know uh i didn't go to school i don't have a you know ser any series any <laughs> series at all i just i just have my experience and so i thought that it could be valuable to give people an insight into my actual portfolio how am i how am i invested in real estate without 
having fifty thousand dollars there? How am I invested in stocks without knowing uh, or being an expert in stocks? How am I investing in alternative investments like art or um, or 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 uh, or uh, interest bearing investments like loans um, that are going to give me returns? And really, you know, how do I adopt those seven streams of income? Uh, or how did I adopt the seven streams of income of every millionaire before I'm a millionaire, right? So that those streams would actually grow and collectively would eventually yield me that million dollar or million plus nest egg uh, that I wanted to get to. And so for me, I'm looking at the next generation. I'm seeing uh, folks in their 20s and 30s. They're getting their first jobs. Yeah, they have an appetite to you know buy things that they don't need to impress people that they don't know right <laughs> and uh for me i'm like look Show you know me. put put that money to work for you now and the earlier you put that to work for you the earlier you will be able to make decisions about where you want to work in exchange for your money because your money is working for you and so that's really what wealth plan is about it's really easy wealthplan.co you could just jump on you leave your number I will literally every month text you an action item. How do you get into stocks? How do you fix your credit? How do you loan money to yourself so that you can actually improve your credit score? Because now, of course, you're not going to default on yourself, right? Um, and so, look, I feel like there's, there's. Um, I went to an Ivy League school. Harvard. and Yeah, and I mean, there were zero classes on budgeting, mm -hmm. zero classes on credit, That's zero it. classes on real estate investing, zero classes on uh, how to even read uh, a chart of, uh, a, a, of a security, zero classes on dividends, zero classes on, and I know people you know, with large lump sums of money in their account who literally are, because of just that lack of education, they, they're not even diversified in their investments. They just, they just like to see the cash sitting in there. In a bank account. Without yeah. understanding that you're actually losing money exactly. by just having, unless, uh, yeah, unless, unless your interest rate in your bank account is beating inflation, you're losing money. So, and these are all just simple concepts. I break it down super simple uh, in the same way that I'm just talking here. And uh, it's just it's just the ability to uh, lay out the cl with to lay it's the ability that I have to lay out with clarity exactly what I'm doing, so that people can make a uh, an informed decision uh, whether they would like to mirror those exact same financial moves, and that's the kind of transparency I deliver in Wealth Plan. So it's not this isn't a class. It's just hey, this is where I'm invested. Uh, the barriers too. to entry, you know, no matter what I've seen, you know, millions of dollars flowing in and out of my accounts, you could start with 500 bucks. And, you know, it comes down to discipline. It comes down to management of your finances. It comes down to actually looking at your accounts every day. Uh, it comes down to having a goal for where you'd like to be. And just like we talked about in a previous segment, dream as big as you want to dream right um because once that vision is you know I, I i had one conversation with the legend quincy jones i say hey, what advice do you have for me he said hey shoot shoot for the moon you land in the stars you know and so you know what is that financial goal that you have for yourself what is that amount that you would like to to leave for your next generation i think in many ways especially in our community we're worried about being check to check because mm -hmm. we got to pay that rent we got to pay you know we started a business we got to maybe you got some employees etc and do you really want to be in that hamster wheel right or do you want to be able to say look the same way i saw at harvard those kids got set up by their parents. I want to be in that position for my next generation. Whether it's your nephews, your nieces, your your kids, or whether you want to, you know, pay back your parents for supporting you for 18, you know, 20, 25, sometimes 30 years of your life. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. uh, what is it that you really want to do? And, it, and um, that pathway, as long as you have patience, as long as you have uh, the ability to delay uh, some gratification as long as you have the ability to have some discipline with your spending and and with your uh, consumption you could be paying yourself and paying yourself really will pay off you know uh, exponentially with compounding you know and so yeah, I thought yeah, about yeah, 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 yeah I mean sure. then you have your time I think yeah. I was I, I was having this debate um, actually a discussion with a lot of my colleagues about time and like how, how valuable it is and then 
I literally played them the quote that you said. You said that wealth, be, wealth, not in the sense of being a monetary thing, but yeah. wealth is be, having the ability to make decisions, to have your own your tongue. Time. Yeah. And they were like, I'm like, that's what I've been trying to say yeah. to y'all. That's yeah. what, that's it right there, yeah. y'all. It's real. It's real. And so, look, I want everybody to have the time because we need more innovators. We need more creators. We need folks that are really, that are dreamers and visionaries that are going to think about these uh, challenges that we're going to be facing because as you've seen with Uber, as you've seen with Airbnb, as you've seen with Dropbox, as you've seen with Google, Amazon, Facebook, Skype, WhatsApp, Brex, Robinhood, whatever it is, the folks that sit down and dream up that solution because they know the challenges that we're about to face and make it easily accessible, affordable, adoptable, those are the folks that stand to reap the benefits of creating that kind of value in the world. And so you need time to be able to just be a visionary. Mm -hmm. You need time to be able to just think. You need time to be able to just say, okay, how can I be more efficient? You need time to have dinners and conversations and take walks with people that are going to invest not only their money, but their time with you to help build that vision and make it happen. And so I'm, I'm, a, I'm a living breathing example of everything that I'm talking about. And I'm also not just looking for wealth plan subscribers. I'm looking for people that want to join this movement. You want to come and work on this team and make this kind of impact so that uh, we are actually, we have the kind of manpower that's necessary to power the foundational systemic change that's going to be necessary to put us in that position this is the first time i think uh and you know we were talking about agrarian to industrial this is the first time where you could just have an idea no brick no mortar mm -hmm. no wood no steel and build a company everyone talks about it. I, I, I've, <laughs> I've seen i've seen the memes like Airbnb is the biggest hotel company. They don't have any hotels. Yeah, yeah, Airbnb is yeah. the, you know, Uber's the biggest travel company. They don't have any cars or trains, right? So it's about allowing yourself the opportunity, A, to be surrounded by folks that are going to inspire you and push you. They're not just going to let you dream here. They're going to push you mm -hmm. to dream as big as you possibly can dream. And also, they're not just going to push you. They're actually going to put their hands to the grind to the grindstone and grind that wheel with you. And so that's that's what I'm looking for as well. Y'all know how to reach me. It's textryan.com. You want specific wealth plan. It's yeah. wealthplan.co. Uh, and man, I'm I'm available. I'm checking my phone. I'm well organized. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna man. make sure I get back to everybody. And we here. Cause that, that, I mean, that ties right into the last thing I was thinking of, and that was the importance of your circle of five theory. Yeah. And th I mean, that pretty much is like, going back to the super phone right yeah you can put comp comp compartmentalize the people that are texting you yeah right so like if i want to talk to just my family i could talk to them right if i want to talk to investors i could just talk to them right if i want to talk to my friends in entertainment i could just talk to them right but that circle of five like you you're going to find five people in there right that can get you to where you need to go right 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 and that you know that's what that's that's uh, i actually have a master class on this it's 30 calls.com and basically what it allows you to do is just say hey how are you really spending your time are you do you really feel like you're stuck and i advocate that whenever you feel like you're stuck you're just one conversation away from all the change that you need to see in your life one conversation away in order to get that to that conversation though you have to have intent and so the 30 calls masterclass at 30 calls.com will literally just walk you through what my process is how did i go from having no investors in my phone to raising 5.6 million dollars for superphone how did i go from having no fans in my phone to doing a two million dollar album cycle making those phone calls is exactly what changed my feeling of being, oh, I feel like I'm stuck to someone saying like, oh, I have this introduction for you. I have this opportunity for you. Uh, I'm top of mind when they have opportunities or I'm top of mind when they have introductions or I'm top of mind when they need help and I can introduce them to people. So I laid that entire um, process that I followed out at uh, 30calls.com. So, I mean, listen, 
my whole life is everything that I'm talking about. This is it's scalable. It's it's uh, <laughs> it's automated the way that it needs to be, so that it allows me the time to interact on a personal level with the folks that matter most and need it the most. And so, you know, whether it's thirty calls dot com, it's wealthplan dot co, it's textryan dot com. All of them lead directly to my text message feed. It's all connected to Superphone and whatever I can do. Anyone who's listening to this podcast can do in half the time, a quarter of the time, a tenth of the time, as long as they apply that vision and ingenuity uh, and apply that relationship management and relationship building to any uh, any goal that they wish to achieve. And so I'm here to help. I'm here to advocate. I invest. I, I make introductions. I coach. I'm, I mentor. I'm here to help, man. Yeah, we're going we to we yeah, hold them to yeah. it. We're going to hold them to it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Ryan, yeah. man, it was a pleasure. Uh, like I said, it was it was a long time coming, but um, I'm glad we got a chance to do this. Yeah, man. Definitely did not disappoint. Absolutely. I know the, I know the audience is going to take a lot of gems from this. Um, any information you want to give the people? Oh, you gave them yeah. already. What uh, social know. media handles? Yeah, like that, uh, yeah. I mean, you can text me. I'll yeah. send you my answer. <laughs> <laughs> text him. From yeah. Ryan, what is it? Text Ryan. Text Ryan. Text Ryan. Text Ryan. Text Ryan. They ain't going to give you his yeah. phone number. That's the number, y'all. Yeah, that's <laughs> it. I mean, who's going to remember a 10 digit phone number? Text Ryan.com. It's easy to remember. You leave your number. I'm sure, I'm sure you know that. And I'll text you right back. Yeah, at the click of a button, 122,000 people will know what you want to say. Yep. Very different from Instagram, where you could have 360,000, no and like 15 people will find out what you yeah. gotta say. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he's killing it, man. Listen, Troy, housekeeping items? Yeah, shout out to everybody on Patreon.com. That's our Proud to Pay program. Uh, as we kind of spoke about, we got that from Nip, so uh, RB to Nip and, and uh, the whole uh, marathon team, uh, All Money In team. Um, you know, we have new tiers there. We got more content for y'all. We're actually giving out some merch um, this time around. So be on the lookout for quarterly merch from us on Patreon. Shout out to Shamita. Um, she actually uh, is transcribing episodes for us. A lot of times people listen to us in cars and on the, in trucks. And wow. um, they can't take notes. They want to take notes. Like, I'm sure when they hear this episode, they're like, yo, I wanted yeah. to write that down. So what we're doing now is transcribing it for people so that they don't have to. They can actually go read the episodes um, when they have the time to do it. So shout out to Shamita. She's actually um, part of the brand. And resumes team too okay so she's doing double duty so shout out to her and um shout out to everybody uh that is supporting us on uh earn your leisure university that is our you know our online school where we do weekly webinars uh, mondays wednesdays and thursdays obviously eyl espanol is is about to be rolled out so be on the, on the lookout for that and everybody that's supporting the merch man shout out to everybody that is is bought our assets over liabilities hoodie and um continue to support that yeah, we gotta get you some merch. We gotta, we gotta get, get you some merch. Some we merch. ran out. We yeah. ran out, but we gotta get you some. We ain't forget about you. Likely so. story. Likely story. <laughs> I'm, gonna tell, I'm gonna shoot you the test. Yeah. <laughs> Philly, okay, Philly, don't forget March 14th, March 15th. We come in. We bring all of our friends. It's gonna be crazy. If you saw the video from Atlanta, you know how crazy it's gonna be. So, looking forward to touching the town. And um, shout out to Brand Resumes. Also, that's our partnership that we've created with our first. Um, collaboration from a guest that we had on the podcast with Brandon and the book tip of this week is the intelligent investor that's Warren Buffett's um one of his favorite books I've seen that he recommended um so yes thank you guys for rocking with us we'll see you next week peace peace <laughs>